Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. This is where we separate the fact from the fiction around COVID-19 and get as many of your questions answered as possible. Back with us today is Professor Ian Fraser from the University of Queensland. An Academy Fellow, he is a recipient of the Prime Minister's Prize for Science, a former Australian of the Year and co-inventor of the technology that enabled the HPV vaccine. Ian, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Paul. Now, let's look at the current situation in Australia. The stricter social distancing measures seem to be working, but we still haven't reached the peak yet. When is that likely to happen? Well, Paul, it's quite difficult to predict that. You're right that the peak is uh, apparently uh, coming in the sense that we can see some slowing of the accumulation of cases. But uh, it really depends on how well we stick with the social distancing and how many more cruise ships arrive and deliver further people into the country. Because it's clear that uh, uh, minor temporary blips merely reflect changes in data gathering rather than a real change in the rate of accumulation of cases. Right. There's been talk about the stricter laws being lifted in some states in 90 days. Do you think that's realistic? At the moment, that would probably be about right. It would imply that we were over the hump of things by then, but it's too early to tell. And uh, I think it's rather dangerous to predict the future when you have so little data. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that really is the point, isn't it? I think while everyone has the question in their minds, when will life return to normal, really you know, that's where it's dangerous to make those predictions too early because we need to make sure that the data is in and right before there's any easing. The one critical bit of information that we don't have relies on the development of a test that we don't yet have, and that is a test which reliably determines who has already been infected with the virus. There are now blood tests available which are supposedly going to show that for us, but until we have good validated data about their sensitivity and specificity, where they are just an experimental test. Once we have those data, it will be very much easier to predict when it will be safe to let people relax the restrictions because people will know themselves whether they're actually protected by virtue of the fact they've already had the infection. Now, Ian, today the Australian Academy of Science is launching a COVID-19 expert database. Why is collaboration vital in this battle against COVID-19? Well, we know that collaboration is always better than competition when it comes to getting answers to difficult questions. And while a little bit of healthy competition spurs us on, the reality is that we all have different resources that we can contribute to this process of developing better ways of pre preventing and controlling COVID-19. And if we work coll collectively, we'll get there faster with less time and money. money. Mm. So to stay across the mountain of information that's being discovered each day, is obviously very difficult it's fast changing situation how do scientists can you give us some insight into how they work together uh globally to help to solve this problem and share that information well the first thing is we need to have a network that enables us to do that and while people for, make informal networks relatively easily with their friends. The reality is that it's better to have somebody organizing the networks, uh, somebody like the Academy of Science or the Academy of Health and Medical Sciences in Australia can act as a broker for that. So also can the, the, the government, state and federal, by providing chat shows and sources of information that we can work out who's doing what. I know that Alan Finkel has a nice list of what's going on globally at the moment. And it's the development of these lists so that people can talk to each other that's really critical. Mm. Now, uh, to change tax slightly, it's being reported that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine can help people with COVID-19. Do they really work? And if so, how? Well, the data that are available to date are, are ambiguous about that. There's certainly no strong evidence that they're working in humans. There is some evidence that they can work in the test tube. Mostly people are now using them along with other drugs, and therefore it's a little difficult to sort out whether which of the drug mixtures that are being given is actually doing the work. But uh, the, these, uh, can, these can be trialed, both in the laboratory and now with the ferret model and then subsequently in humans. And that's basically what's happening. I want to ask some questions from our followers on social media. Ibina C on YouTube has asked, why isn't intravenous vitamin C not being used widely in our hospitals? I, I have to be honest and say that there are, I'm approached about 20 times a day by people who suggest 
unusual treatments for uh, COVID-19, either to prevent the infection or to treat it once it's there. If they have a good sound rational basis, they should be tried. If there's no obvious rational basis, then we just add them to the list of things that people have suggested because mm -hmm. there are so many things where we have good evidence that they might work and need to be trialed that we can't do enough trials to solve everybody's interests. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really interesting point to clarify, though, that, that you know, as the community is searching and, and discussing, well, I've heard this thing works or that thing works, um, the, to have the point that actually there's only a limited number of uh, treatments that it can actually be tested so that we know that they work. That's actually what scientists are focusing on. Is that a good way to put it? Yes, look, the reality is that we have three levels of testing we can do. We can do stuff in the laboratory, which gives us a clue as to which way we might be going. If it's a treatment that looks hopeful or a prevention that looks hopeful, then we have a ferret model, which CSIRO have developed and used for, for SARS in the past and now for SARS too. Uh, and if that gives encouraging results, then it's reasonable to go into humans. Alternatively, if the ferret model doesn't suit, you just have to go directly into humans, but then you have to accept that you're doing experimental medicine and there has to be a good rational basis for first of all, believing that it will not make things worse. And then secondly, that it might have some benefit. From Facebook, Stephen Crow asks, what evidence is there that a broad vaccine is actually feasible and worth researching? My personal opinion about that is that we, we don't have enough evidence yet to know whether the vaccine will, a vaccine is feasible. Uh, on the plus side, we've managed to develop vaccines for almost every infection that we've been concerned about in the past, with some notable exceptions. Uh, on the minus side, this is an infection which only infects the upper airway tract, and we don't have any vaccines which protect us against viruses which infect the upper airways at the moment. And the immune system in the upper airways is quite distinct from the immune system in our blood. And most vaccines develop immunity in our blood. So at the moment, it's an open question. OK, that's that's really helpful to clarify, you know, exactly where we are on on that. Now, we've had quite a few comments about ibuprofen. There's been online speculation that it could be harmful to people with COVID-19. Is there any evidence for that? There is no direct evidence to support that. The whole story started with a, a number of twi Twitters following uh, statements made by politicians. Uh, the reality is that ibuprofen does suppress inflammation, but uh, there is no evidence that it suppresses the sort of inflammation that's causing COVID-19, nor is it enhancing the suppression of the immunity that would fight COVID-19. So it's neither a plus or a minus. Okay, that's really helpful to clarify. Thank you. Now, the World Health, Health Organization is reviewing its recommendations around the use of masks. So much conflicting information. What's your view about wearing masks if you have no symptoms? And should you try making one if you can't buy one or wear a bandana or some other protective um, clothing? The most useful place for a mask is on the face of somebody who's actually infected because it stops them spreading the infection to other people. Uh, if you think you might be infected, then wearing a mask is a good idea too, even if you're not actually infected. If you're not infected, then there is a shortage of masks and they're probably better worn by people who are working in close contact with people who are infected. But if you do decide to make a mask yourself, the most useful thing it does is stop you putting your hand on your face because it's hand to face transmission of virus from surfaces to your hands to your face that spread this virus most effectively. Okay, terrific advice. Thank you. Now, Geraldine Nicholas asks us uh, on Twitter, how do I isolate someone I live with inside my home? Do you have any advice for her? Yeah, well, that's a very important question because more of us are being asked to do this as people have contacted people who've had the virus or might have the virus. So social isolation really means exactly that. They should be confined to within a defined area in the house which can be closed off by doors from the rest of the house. You have to make sure that they have access to bathroom facilities. And if that can't be done within the close space that they're living in, then it means that they should go to the bathroom when you're not around. And the surfaces should be properly disinfected before somebody else uses that facility. Finally, you have to think about taking food and bringing stuff out from the room. And there the important thing is you leave it for them to pick up from outside the room when you're not there. 
and they have the means, if possible, to clean the stuff up, sterilise it within the room. But if that can't be done, then you will have to collect it, assuming that it's infected, take it to somewhere where it can be washed and cleaned. And then you have to assume that your hands, or if you've been wearing gloves, your gloves are contaminated, and therefore pro properly treat them before you do anything else. That means hand washing for practical purposes. Ian, two final questions. The Academy of Science has called for the government to release its scientific modelling. Why is that important? Look, it's really important that we understand the basis of the decisions that are being made on our behalf by government. Some of these decisions are quite uh, strict and impose quite uh, limiting rules on what we're allowed to do. So we really need to know that the evidence that's being used to support these decisions is there and how it was derived. No evidence base will be perfect, but it's better to understand how the evidence base was created than not to know at all. Hmm. And lastly, the global pandemic can only be solved by science. What do you hope Australia can learn from this crisis? Well, obviously, in the short term, we have to learn how to deal with the current crisis. But I think more importantly, we also have to set in place a strategy for dealing with similar pandemics in the future, which is robust enough that it will fit any sort of pandemic, regardless of the means of spread of the infectious agent. We had a good pandemic pro process for flu, which was set up after the uh, H1N1 flu in 2009, swine flu. But it wasn't really fit for purpose for an airborne virus uh, when uh, we needed to deal with what we have had to deal with with COVID-19. We need to think about having enough capacity to make vaccines of different sorts, test different drugs, have animal models, and some resources on tap that can be turned on pretty quickly if another pandemic arises. Because we've had several over the course of human history and we're going to continue to have them. Yeah, so that really recalls on a, a, an investment in science, an investment in having those resources ready to turn on, as you say. Yes, this is the whole the point of the exercise that we need to learn from what's happened with COVID-19 so that the next time something like this happens, we actually have the resources ready. And that means scientists are able to do the work. It means equipment available for it. It means a plan of how we're going to use it. And I think it would be fair to say that most governments worldwide uh, were caught unawares when this happened this time around. And hopefully in the future, they will be more prepared to deal with events like this. Professor Ian Fraser, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Paul. I'll be back on Monday with Professor Peter Doherty. His last appearance on the show created lots of headlines. If you missed that episode, you can find it on our YouTube and Facebook pages, where you can also leave us your questions in the comments section under any of our posts. I'm Paul Richards. See you on Monday. Thank you.